This is the Kingdom Movement Podcast, a place where we will explore through conversation how discipleship, theology, and community really can transform our world. Hey guys, the episode you're about to listen to is a previous recording of our lecture we did on relationships, marriage, and sex. Because it is a previous recording, um, the audio quality isn't as good. We weren't using the normal equipment that we do for the podcast. So if you hear some background noise or my voice isn't as clear, or you hear someone in the audience asking questions, that's why the quality isn't quite what you've come to expect from the normal podcast. But we thought the discussions, the questions asked, We're so good that we wanted to put it on the podcast anyways because this is such a vital topic and we didn't want to just present information, but we wanted to have the questions and the discussion available from that previous lecture. So with all that in mind, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Kingdom Movement Podcast. Relationship. And if we're going into the relationship, 
and we're still working on them to be honest with that person. Not to surprise them later and say, yeah, I really do still struggle with, um, uh, with feeling confident because I never had a mom or dad that ever encouraged me in anything that I did. You know what I'm saying? And so I think honesty is the biggest piece, being upfront about, hey, these are the weaknesses in my life. Obviously, the relationship has to get to a point, right? You don't just tell that on the first date. <laughs> um, but once you, there's trust, there's relationship there. But I think as well, even when we allow that person into that weakness, that doesn't mean that they become the boy, the person to fill that void. We have to continually surrender to God. And if, sometimes it does take professional help to work through things, to work through trauma. Because some people have been traumatized by some horrible things, right? And it's not enough to just say, I'll just pray about it, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, right? Like, we have to be willing to put in the hard work to say, I, I know I have to change. I know I have to find my security in the right things. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Because we all have them, right? Yeah. Even now, I'm married five years. Like, I'm finding out things about myself. You know what I'm saying? And so it, it's a part of life. But we can't just say, ah, this is who I am, right? Yeah. Sucks for you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the verse to close it out, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you, right? You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. <laughs> Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So, obviously, we can make excuses, right? But in reality, like, we have to become the kinds of people um, that really, truly do love God, that want to love other people, and that are willing to work through our own baggage, right? Cool. All right, I love this picture. She looks so happy to be married. <laughs> I hope you don't look like that when you get married, eh? to God. Does that make sense? 
that he is the bride coming for his groom. Have you heard that, right? That Jesus is the bride coming for his groom. It's this picture language, uh, and marriage is the picture that God uses to describe his relationship with us, which is a legally binding covenant faithfulness to us. So faithfulness becomes the key issue to our relationship with him and to others, being faithful. Now, does faithfulness or faithful need any sort of clarifying for you guys? And it's okay to be honest. If you want to know what that exactly means, or do you feel like you have a firm grasp? It means you're binding yourself to that person, right? Yeah. That you're faithful to your family. You're not going to betray them, right? You're not going to stab them in the back. You're not going to use them for your own purposes, hopefully, right? Yeah. But we as humanity have shown time and time and time again that we are often faithless, right? That we haven't been faithful. Whether it's to God, that we don't keep our promises to Him, or we don't act in, in line with what we promised that we would. And to, our, to each other, right? We've betrayed each other in small and big ways at times. Now we've stabbed each other in the back. We've talked bad about our friends before, right? To look good in front of other people. We've maybe cheated on other people or cheated people or stole from them. So we've proven that we are faithless at times, right? But marriage is an institution that is set up in a similar way to our relationship with God. We are declaring to everyone that we are binding ourselves in faithfulness to this person, right? That they are declaring to you, and you are declaring to them that I am going to be faithful through difficult and through good, through um, you know financial struggle. We even say it right through bad times and good times, through financial struggles, for through health and sickness. No matter what, I'm binding my life legally in faithfulness before God to this person, right? That's what marriage is all about, and the reason why that's important is. It represents the kind of love and commitment that God has towards us. So we are to love other people the way that God loves us, and specifically our marriages. So marriage becomes a picture of what true love is. True love is uh, a kind of love that reflects God's relating to other people. Does that make sense? So God relates to us through faithfulness. That he keeps his promises, he has our back, that he's standing um, to protect us, that he loves us, that he seeks our good. These are all qualities about God that he has towards us, right? So when, to, when we enter marriage, we are saying that we are going to do our best to reflect those kind of qualities to this other person. So that is devoted faithfulness. So what does scripture say about marriage and how we can practice it well? In Ecclesiastes, it says two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. One person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two standing back to back can conquer. Three are even better for a triple braid cord is not easily broken. And that's obviously talking about companionship, but we can relate it to marriage. Haven't you read, you reply that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. They are no longer two, but they are one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So the Bible talks about at the beginning, right? God created us as two distinct creatures, right? Male and female. But with the intention that when brought together, become one. Now, obviously, you're not literally one physical being. But you together in marriage become basically one unit, right? A cohesive uh, unit that is working with one single mind to bring about the purposes of God, right? In your family and in your relationship. In Ephesians, it says, and further, so this is kind of laying out the framework of our roles in marriage, okay? So Paul lays them out in Ephesians, and it says, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. All right, I'm going to say it one more time. Submit to one another. Not wives only submit to your husbands. How many of you have heard that? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, okay, so this is for you ladies. This means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of his body, the church. 
as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands and everything. So we submit out of a, a knowing understanding, right, mm -hmm. that this person is going to seek our good. Because how does Christ love the church, right? He only seeks their benefit, that he fights for them, that he works for them, that he seeks to bring them to a place that they are like him, right? That's how Christ relates to us. For husbands, this means you love your wives just as Christ has loved the church. Again, right? There's that idea that we are to love our wives so much that it is not about it a power struggle. It's about bringing them beside us, right? Because he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present to her, present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies, right? Love their own bodies. You would never do anything bad to your own body, right? You wouldn't cut off your own arm. You wouldn't punch yourself in the face. You wouldn't speak ill about yourself, right? You would love your own body and treat it well. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. Because it's no longer about just you, right? That when you love your wives, you're actually loving yourself as well because she has become a part of who you are. No one hates his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. And scripture says again, uh, a man leaves his father and mother and joins his wife, and they are united as one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So first, Peter is kind of regurgitating this, but he's saying a few other things. In the same way, you wives must accept the authorities of your husband. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news... Your godly lives will speak to them without words. So he's basically saying that when you respect and honor your husband, that even if they're not seeking after the Lord, your godly character, you're willing to say, even when I think I disagree with you, I'm going to honor you, right? Because that's how we love one another. That will speak to them, right? That will touch their hearts. And they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about outward beauty and fancy hairstyles and expensive jewelry beautiful clothes. It's not saying that you can't have those things, but don't make that the priority of your life, right? Yeah. Of looking like the, the Instagram model so everyone gives you the likes. That's not what builds a healthy marriage, right? Yeah. Um, you should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of the gentle and quiet, quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abram, and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear. When you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. So what I love about this is it's saying that you, what really makes you a godly wife is that you will do what's right. Uh, you will do what's right no matter what you think your husband will say or do. That's what it's saying. That really you're seeking what makes you a godly wife and a beautiful wife is when you seek after the, after Jesus above everything else, right? And that example will speak to him. That love, that unconditional love that you extend to him, that respect to him, uh, will speak to him. And that you are actually to do that even beyond uh, just what you think your husband wants you to do, right? Because he might say to you, ah, I, I don't want you to be like Jesus in this area of your life, right? Because it's not beneficial to me, but that's not what you're supposed to do. And husbands, in the same way, you must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. So what, God's, what Peter's saying is God won't even listen to your prayers if you don't treat your wife well. Yeah. That's what he's saying. If you can't treat your wife well, why will God listen to you? So, there's a lot to unpack here, right? But the highlights are this. For husbands, we are meant to love and care for our wives as we would our own bodies. That means in our interests and our needs, right? So abuse is the exact opposite of God's purposes. That abuse is the exact opposite of God's purposes. When we uh, physically abuse our wives, 
when we emotionally abuse our wives, when we verbally abuse our wives, we are not acting in align with who God has created our relationship to be, right? We are, in fact, destroying the purpose of what God has for our marriages. And we are to give our lives in loving service to her as Jesus lovingly served us. So we always use Jesus as the model, right? Jesus served the church. He talks about, when, when he talks about headship and lordship, what was the example that Jesus gives as headship and lordship, right? He washed his disciples' feet. He talked to the least of these. He was willing to humble himself. So in the same way, when we talk about headship and lordship in our families, it's not so much about having a power to, you know, wield and using our authority to make our wives do what we want them to, but it's about serving our wives, right? Putting their needs above our own. Uh, we are to honor our wives, not dismissing their thoughts and opinions, but we value them as equal partners. Uh, she's equal with us in this new life God has given us. We are to respect that. That means if she's equal with us in the new life, she has just as much authority and voice to speak about God as us, right? We are to show understanding towards her, empathy and acknowledgement. We are to treat and care for her well. If we desire to God to value our prayers, we are to live in mutual submission. Wives, we should submit, and I look this up, what does biblical submit mean? This means being self, having selflessness, service, accountability, and respect for our partner, not diminishing their opinion. How many of you, if you're honest, have heard a wife cut down their husband in front of other people? <laughs> okay, ladies, this is speaking to you. Eh? <laughs> Wives are to see themselves as one unit with their husbands, working together for a common purpose. Wives should honor their husbands by being a model of Christ, even when their husbands aren't being a model of Christ. This is the aim to show them the love of Christ. Wives should not pursue their value in their appearance. Rather, they should seek that value from God. Wives should put their value and trust in God over all others. By doing this, wives honor their husbands by being obedient to God first. Doing what is right is even more important than being fearful of what your husbands might do. So, the overall point is that when we enter into a covenant of marriage, we are declaring to the world that this person is someone you have chosen to submit your life to in love. That's important, right? So when we make a marriage covenant, it, I know this sounds strong, right? But the whole reason why we enter into marriage is because we found someone that we trust, Right? that actually is going to seek our benefit, that does want to share their lives with us, that is going to live like one unit with us. You know what I'm saying? So this isn't a, a dread that we should fear, but it's that we found someone that we really trust and love that is going to share this life with us. Does that make sense? So you've made a bold and daring commitment because in this person you have found someone you believe loves and cares for you as if you were their own body. That's the point, right? That this person loves and cares for you as if you were them. And thus, once united, you are saying it is no longer me and you, but it's us. It's no longer me and you, but us. This is meant to say our goals and our life are meant to work together for a common purpose, mutual love, and faithfulness to one another. That's marriage, huh? How many of you feel like you have seen that model well? Not to point out your parents and pick on them. I'm not trying to do that. But how many of you feel like you have seen a model of that somewhere in your life? Seen it done well? Nice. So half of us, maybe. But this is super important, right? If we, and I really believe this about kingdom movement, that if we really put the practices of Jesus into our lives seriously, this group right here, right, this seed that has been planted, can be the beginning of great change in books one. I'm talking about complete transformation. You talk about transforming history, right? Or future history. It can, it can happen in this room if we take Jesus seriously. And I think it really, really, really begins not even on the campuses, but in the home. In the home. That healthy families replicate healthy families. Unhealthy families replicate unhealthy families, right? When there's fatherless homes, there's likely to be more fatherless homes, right? But when there's a dad, a husband that sticks around, that is committed, that treats his family, 
especially his wife, like his own body, what is that model to his sons and his daughters, right? To his daughters, this is the expectation of what a man should be. And to his sons, this is the expectation I'm expecting from you on how you'll treat your future spouse, right? So in order to do this, maybe some of you have to break the cycle in your families, right? That you're going to be the first generation that actually puts this into practice. And for some of you, you're just carrying on the legacy, right? But it's super important that we get this right because this really does affect the future. Does that make sense? Cool. Any thoughts? Any questions? Good. So yeah, it's a declaration in the lifetime of putting into practice that we can be a witness to the world what love really is. That's what marriage is all about. We're witnessing to the world what a, the greatest form of love really looks like, right? And it goes beyond just having sex together. <laughs> it goes beyond just all the physical attraction, but it's a deep, committed faithfulness through bad and good that I love you, you love me, let's figure it out, right? All right, so before we dive into this, do you guys have any questions about marriage, any thoughts, opinions you want to share? Okay, this is more of a butler question. Yeah. Lots of questions. And it's something that I've noticed because I spend a lot of time online. Like, the, the, the part when it, when it says <coughs> women submit to you. Mm. Because if you spend a lot of time online, you see that Somewhere, unfortunately, the church where I'm from, the church here, and the church in a lot of places, I feel like has really struggled with to articulate well, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's, it is mutual submission. That is what love ultimately is. That love seeks, again, right, we go back to relationships, and this is the reason why we're building. We're building on the blocks, right? Relationships to marriage. Because relationship, relating to one another is always about, should this core of it be, seeking to serve and love the other person, right? And sometimes love is telling the truth, right? Sometimes love is saying, hey, I see this in you, and it's not healthy, it's not good. You know what I mean? Love isn't just letting the person get off with whatever they want to do. But if that's the base on how we're building our regular relationships, that we're loving and seeking the benefit of the other person, we will carry that over into our marriages, right? And we will begin to form a deeper relationship that's already mutually submitted, right? Mutually submitted, which is we submit in different ways, right? I think there is a distinction in that it's in there. But the whole point is that husbands are to love and cherish and value their wives so much that they are really, in a way, their, their role is to serve and to build them up, right? And their wives, their roles are to honor to speak life, to encourage, to, to really champion their husbands as well, right? But it, it, the reason why it doesn't work a lot of times is both sides aren't willing to pick up their end, right? Mm -hmm. There'd be absolutely, I don't think, any argument from ladies about this whole idea, in scripture about the whole idea of submitting to your husbands in the sense that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. If husbands treated their wives like their own bodies, right? But the problem is that they don't, and so then it becomes a, an authoritarian, like, you are under me, you will listen to me. And vice versa, husbands may not want to treat their wives like their own bodies, because they feel like their own body undercuts them wherever they go. You get what I'm saying? That they speak bad about them in front of their friends, which is totally something guys do not like, by the way, ladies. <laughs> or they feel disrespected, or they don't feel loved, right? And so it makes it hard for them to want to love their own body when they feel like their own body doesn't love them. You get what I'm saying? And so it, it takes 
both sides willing to submit their lives to one another and say, you know what, I got my crap, you have your crap, right? But let's work on it together in faithful love and commitment to one another. And so in the times where you feel like I'm not respecting you, I want to work on that, right? And in the times that you feel like I'm, you know, using authority to abuse you or to put you down or to put you in your place, then I'm not really treating you like my own body, right? I'm not really loving you. I'm not respecting your voice. And so I need to change. And I think it's in those areas that it, you know, it sounds great on paper, right? We can put it on the PowerPoint, but it's going to be a lot of work in our marriages. There's a lot of work in our marriages. Our ma marriage, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but every day I'm trying to honor Vanessa, right? I'm trying to see what's best for her. That's why sometimes you'll, you'll maybe hear me say, I need to talk to Vanessa before I make that decision. And I get laughed at here. I'm serious. People think it's crazy. And especially in Mozambique. We had one guy on the staff with us, and he was one of my good buddies. And they're a bit more like, they, in Mozambique, they don't even have women preachers. Like, they're a bit more heavy handed. They take this to another level. And he said to me, like, I thought it was the strangest thing one day when he asked me to help him with something. And I said, yeah, let me just talk to Vanessa real quick, see if I can do it. He's like, I thought, I said, what was the weird thing that threw you off the most when you first met me? And he's like, when you would ask Vanessa permission to like do something, he's like, I didn't understand that. He's like, why wouldn't you just go do it? And I was like, well, I, I want to have a good marriage, so. <laughs> no, and, and it wasn't permission, it's an honoring of Vanessa, right? Sure, I could get in my car and drive off and leave, but what does that say to her, right? That I don't value her opinion. I don't care what ha how inconveniences her, or I don't care about what's on her schedule or what she has going on, because it's only about what I have going on, right? Mm -hmm. So even just the conversation, it's not that Vanessa is saying, all right, you know, I'll let you leave the house today, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but it's about honoring one another, right? Respecting one another, because I love her. Her opinion matters to me. If she doesn't like something, I'm not just gonna be like, well, that sucks, I'm gonna do it anyways, right? Because I love her. I want her to know that I value her. I don't always do it well. My biggest weakness is probably that at times I'll forget to communicate things to her, right? So I have to work on that. I have to get better. Because um, we all have our weaknesses. But that, that should be the, the heart of our marriages, right? That we're not always going to do it well, but that we are working to honor the other person. Does that make sense? Yes. So there's this thing that... Um the guy leads, right, leads. And obviously he has to submit to his wife, but then does that contradict that kind of um, idea? Yeah, so what do you mean by lead? I think is the big uh, question I'm I have to ask like, ourselves. Yeah. I'm really, <laughs> I don't know, but mm -hmm. like, uh, Yeah, and I would say we've taken that lead and we've made we so we take so let's go back to it because it'll be helpful. So yeah, when it says this means submit to your husbands as the Lord, for a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body. The church is the church submits to Christ, so you want to submit to your husbands and everything. And again, we have to look at what is Christ to the church and how does he lead the church, right? And how does he lead them? He washed their feet, right? He served them. And so when the Bible talks about leading, it's leading from a place of loving servanthood. That if anyone is to be great in the kingdom of God, they must become the least of these, right? So Jesus gives the model of leadership. The world's leadership is the guy who takes charge and he kills everybody that stands in his way and he puts in his his people to, and he holds on to power, right? You get power at any means. And power equals leadership. But Jesus' great reversal is that leadership in the kingdom of God is servanthood to those that you love and trusting in God to provide and make a way. Now obviously there comes times where decisions have to be made in your home, right? And you may disagree. And I think at that point, the best advice that I've ever heard on it is, who has the most stake in that decision? Does that make sense? 
Because sometimes, you know, if it's like the interior of your home, <laughs> right? Like maybe I don't like that wall art piece as much you know, as Vanessa does. But Vanessa really, she's the one that put it all together. So yeah, taking the position of I'm the husband, I can lead, I could demand of her, no, I don't want that you know, couch in our house. But all that's going to do is create tension in my marriage, right? Mm -hmm. So she's the one that's more invested. I'm going to trust her opinion on that, right? But there's times where in maybe a certain aspect of ministry, maybe I have to make, I have the final word because I've invested the most. Does that make sense? And then there's times where it, it comes down to both, right? Where it's like, where do, we, where do we move because we both have job opportunities, right? And I think in a loving marriage, we can figure it out, right? You can figure out what's going to work best. And I don't think the best way to break down conversation in our marriages is for guys to go and say, well, I'm the man, so you're going to listen to me on this one, right? Because she may listen to you, but you've lost her now, right? Because you're not operating from a place of love. You're operating from a place of, I want what I want. Does that make sense? So leading is servanthood. It's setting the example of character. It's all those things, right? Yeah, get into it. <laughs> yeah. Like if, if there's too much democracy in decision making, mm. you, you, you have to listen to the other party side, right? And hear what they have to say about the decision which you guys have to make. Yeah. Is there really room for growth in that? Uh, you moving forward with her on that decision? Or is it like you're taking one step forward, two steps back all the time? What do you mean by that? So, like when you say it again. If you allow uh, too much room for democracy mm. in decision making, let's say with your wife, right? Is there room for growth? As in, does the marriage actually uh, grow in the, the sense of both of you going to a point where uh, you both uh, emotionally, physically, but above all spiritually moving forward, right? Is there room for growth in that sense? I think there's more growth in that sense than if you were to squash an opinion. Because it's easy when you have power. This is the biggest thing. When you have power, the easy thing is to make everyone fall in line to what you want. And Peter even talks about it. Guys typically, you know, 90% of the time are going to be the physically stronger of the two, right? There's some girls out there that, <laughs> but most of the time, right? So by coercion, or by fear, or by just brute, you know, whatever, you could technically make your wife probably cower to what you want. But is that spiritual growth? Are you growing? No. You're, you're killing your relationship then. And I think democracy or however you want to phrase it, like we constantly have to be dialed. It's harder. It is harder to dialogue sometimes. There are times where I just want to be able to do what I believe is best. But for the sake of my marriage, I know that if I did it, it's going to create tension. You get what I'm saying? And that doesn't always mean, you know, sometimes there are moments where I've had to do something that it's like, I believe is best. You know what I mean? Maybe it's like, I believe we should give to this guy over here or something. I don't, I'm making this up. But maybe Vanessa's like, no, I don't think you should. I think in those moments, the only time that we really go against the grain, let's say, is when we really, really believe that God is asking us to do something and we don't feel like our spouse is getting in line with that. Does that make sense? Because the ultimate authority is Jesus. Yeah. So, so one thing... She didn't say no, but I don't think I necessarily had her huge approval on it. There was something where we wanted to give to somebody or do something. And it was quite a significant amount of money. But it, I don't even remember all the details because it was a while ago. But at the end of it, she really did feel a confirmation of that's what we were supposed to do. You know what I mean? There's been times where I've done something and I know Vanessa's like, ah, I think we should wait. And then I realized after I did it, because that's my personality, I'm like, let's do it, right? 
And then she thinks about it way more than I do, and then it usually ends up like, yeah, maybe I should have listened to Vanessa on that one. So it's a, a give and take, right? And I'm not saying that it's always gonna work out uh, perfectly, but I think the more we honor our spouse's voice, the better our marriage is going to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, but how about what if uh, the Holy Spirit was pressing you? Uh, and that's what I'm saying. If you feel like the Holy Spirit really is telling you something. But I think, we again, we can't allow that to become an excuse in our life as if the Holy Spirit can't speak to her as well, right? What's up? I, I'm gonna get it. I also think that it adds value to making sure you're marrying the right person. Yeah. Because if you marry the right person, God's going to speak to both of you. And you're going to be able to come to decisions together. I don't, I think that's a lot of times what the enemy and what the world tells us to do is that we constantly have to be fighting against each other. And that's just not the case. We're supposed to come together and make decisions together. And if we do it together, we do it a lot stronger than if one side is saying, well, you should listen to me. And the other side is saying, you should listen to me. Why don't we try and come up with a solution together? And maybe both of us aren't necessarily getting what we want, but we're doing it together. And that's what marriage is supposed to be, is a one accord going yeah. forward. Yeah. We're one unit, right? Yeah. It's not me and you anymore. It's us. Yeah, it's us. And I think we have to change our thinking. That is probably the biggest adjustment all of you will have when you first get married. Is starting, stopping your thought process as me and this person to us. What is good for us? Because sometimes something might be really good for you and not good for them, well then it's not good for us, right? Yeah. Cool. Alright. Any other thoughts before we move on to not this one topic? Real quick? <laughs> cool. Alright, so discussions on marriage, about cheating, broken trust, abuse, and divorce. So obviously there's precedent in the Bible for the breaking of this covenant, right? And Jesus, I, I believe I have it in here, he even says, you know, this was permitted because of people's hard hearts towards one another. Hard hearts not meaning like they were stubborn and they didn't want to figure it out, but hardened hearts because we've hardened our hearts towards this person we were meant to share our lives with, right? And unfortunately, that happens in marriage. We see it uh, way more than we should, but marriages deteriorate, there's broken trust, there's cheating, there's abuse, and typically when that happens, obviously something has gone wrong, right? Or even the marriage was started on a broken premise in the first place, right? Essentially physical romance that made people decide, let's just get married, you know what I mean? Or I'm attracted to this person, oh, this person's really hot, I want to marry them, blah, blah, blah. And the, the core values of what a marriage was always meant to be built on weren't there. You know what I'm saying? And it will, I'm honestly, maybe this is an arrogance or ignorant statement or both. I am always really surprised when people who are married who aren't Christians stick it out in the long haul. Because the main principles that you need for marriage are really built on godly principles, right? Mutual submission, love for the other person, deep, deep love. And most people who don't follow Jesus typically operate from a very self-focused mindset, if that makes sense, right? There, there's obviously always the exceptions. I'm not saying people who aren't Christians don't have love, right? I'm not saying that they can't not be selfish. But when push comes to shove, when hard times come, people often default to protect self. You get what I'm saying? That there has to be an outside source that really drives us to really say that I need to put this other person's needs as just as important as my own. So when we talk about these things, um, cheating and broken trust and abuse and divorce, it, it always stems from some sort of brokenness in our own lives, right? No one gets married and says, I want to hit my spouse, right? No one gets married and says, I want to cheat on them and sleep with someone else. You know what I mean? But there's either broken, broken circumstances that put them in a difficult situation that was bound to fail in the first place, or there's brokenness inside of them that have never been dealt with. I don't know where she went, but she brought up a good point, right? That if we aren't willing to deal with the things in our own lives, the past trauma and abuse or other issues that we've had, then we are bound to bring that into our marriage in unhealthy ways, right? Like if we see our dads cheating on our moms all the time, that doesn't automatically mean that we will do it. 
but it does give us a framework from which we, we operate, right? Because that's the only, and it, you can blame the person and you can't. There's accountability, right? You're accountable for your actions, but if that's all you've ever been modeled, it's hard to know what a healthy marriage looks like, right? We operate, it's like an operating system, right? We operate off of the operating system that we've been given. But the good news is, is that Jesus gives us a new operating system, right? He gives us the power to break those, and that's really in my mind what generational curses are. It's not something a witch doctor puts on you, but it's, it's this idea that generations after generations have given you a pattern of living and being, and we default into those patterns, right? That if our family has always lied, stolen, and been rude to each other, it's very likely unless something dramatically changes us, we're going to eventually be a liar, a thief, and talk bad about our families, right? Unless something transforms us, unless something intervenes, or we say, no, I'm not going to be like that no matter what it costs me, right? Because how many people have said, I'm not going to be like my mom, I'm not going to be like my dad, and then we end up just being just exactly like them in some area, right? It's because that's the pattern, that's what has been put into us from day one, right? And so in order to break these patterns, these habits, we have to make a conscious decision. It's not enough to just say, I don't want to abuse my wife like my dad did, right? Mm -hmm. We have to make steps on, if we have anger issues in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to bleed into our marriages, so we have to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. We have to come to the terms that we need to transform this area of our lives. If, you know, it, our parents were promiscuous, like... And we have a tendency to, to date around, right? We have to be willing to say, what in me, why do I do this, first of all? Why do I need this, and how can I change so that I can be the kind of person that brings health into my marriage, not sickness? Does that make sense? And even for me, I recognize, like, in my own life that my dad, before he gave his life to Christ, was kind of a promiscuous guy, right? When he gave his life to Christ, the pattern changed. But even part of that, that I didn't even see when I was younger, was a part of me, right? Even biologically, that I had to learn to kill in my own life. It was something that I recognized, like, man, like, his dad kind of did this. Who knows what my great-great-grandpa did. But that has to end with me, right? That I'm not going to bring that into my house. And I think that's the kind of attitude that we have to have. That's not coming into my house, right? So here's kind of what the Lord, or the scripture has to say about divorce. Here's a, another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young, but you have been unfaithful to her or him. Though she or he remain faithful, your faithful partner the wife or husband of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife or husband? In body and spirit, you are his or hers. And what, what does the Lord want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart, remain loyal to your spouse of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife or husband is to overwhelm them with cruelty. So guard your heart, do not be unfaithful. And so the Lord hates it because it is a symbol of what is wrong with the world, not what is right, right? Mm -hmm. Marriage done well is the example of what God's perfect love looks like, right? Committed faithfulness. That's ultimately what God desires, is committed faithfulness. So when we break that committed faithfulness, we're breaking what God desires. That's why God hates divorce. Not because, you know, he wants people to be unhappy, but because committed faithfulness to work it out and to bring our lives back into accordance with his love is his desire. So, in Matthew says this, Some Pharisees came to him, him being Jesus, to test him. He asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason, right? This is any and every reason. And in some Jewish circles, they believed even if the wife, like, messed up the soup that day, the husband had a right to divorce her. It was pretty, pretty dumb, let's just say that. And so, yeah. So Jesus says, haven't you read that the, at the beginning the creator God made the male and female? Here it is again, right? He has made them one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. 
Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses forbid you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So Jesus is very strong on this, right? That unless there is some sort of unfaithfulness, right, covenant-breaking act, you are committing adultery when you leave your spouse and go outside of that covenant. I would throw, even though Jesus doesn't say it directly, I would throw physical abuse into this as well, right? Because you are no longer acting in covenant faithfulness to that person. So the, the permission is basically when we break covenant faithfulness to our partner, that in sexual acts and when we disregard them as even our own, right? In physical abuse, that is that is the line, right? But everything else, maybe they, they deal with anger, maybe they're they're hard headed at times, maybe they're rude. Once you make that covenant commitment, that covenant commitment is all about staying faithful to that person to make it work. Does that make sense? And if unchecked, anger and you know other issues, I'm just you know, I'm sorry I'm blanking on anything else, but other tensions that are in our marriage, right? Maybe it's never listening to your wife's opinion or whatever, you know? All these other issues can lead to these covenant-breaking acts, right? They can lead to abuse. They can lead to cheating, but when unchecked. But the purpose is Jesus is saying marriage was always meant to be the ultimate symbol of that covenant faithful love, right? And it's not something that we just flippantly break because it's inconvenient for us. We're called to work it out when things get hard. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Any thoughts? Yeah. I think just a thought, an opinion is, um, I don't think our age group understands how serious marriage is. I feel like people just go around like, yo, I want to marry this girl. I want to marry this guy. And I also think about how social media also just glamorizes marriage. It has, if you can glamorize it, but I feel like they glamorize it to a point where, like, you know how people be like, if, if it's not working for you, leave, you know? And I feel like if it's not working for you, some people have the pettiest reasons to say, I want to divorce or leave. Not to say it, some people don't want to do I don't know. But I feel like the way people are just marrying and just be divorcing, I don't think our age group or our generation or whatever understands how serious um, marriage is. I also just get surprised and shocked. I mean, some people, you know, to eat the old, but like people that meet someone and then six months later they're getting married. I mean, that's why I think everyone is different. Okay? Everyone is different. <laughs> there's that, there's marrying young. I feel like. There's someone that said something that before getting married, people should um, have a conversation with someone who's divorced. Yeah, because I feel like some people would just enter and say, you know, like, I love this person, but do you understand mar marriage is something that, if you people, it's like, I, I don't know if people have watched the movie, um, but I, you should watch it. This guy, his friend takes um, a glass, the shakers for salt and pepper, and, and he glues them together and says, "If you if you rip this, if you rip it apart, one of it will break your bones." And I feel like people don't understand that when people get married, it's like you're gluing yourself to someone. When you divorce someone, it's like. You're going to see them at some point in your life, and that is the fruit of death. You're going to see them every other day, and you might say, man, that is a really big, that person, what, what, what. And if, you, if, he, if our age group is making it seem like it's nice to be married and divorced and just get in a relationship and get, as if you're wearing a sock and taking it off, I just feel like it, it's very dangerous. So with what, I'm, what, with what I'm seeing right now, I feel like really need to make like take it in the 
biblical sense and not just to say I'm in love with this person, you know, like even things like submission, things like those, I feel like people just throw them around so loosely, mm -hmm. they don't understand like that some of these things are biblical. Submission is biblical. Mm -hmm. Not just saying, hey, you should submit to your your, your husband, what, what, what. So that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could go on about this for eight hours. Yeah. Yeah.
Hey guys, this is Jake. If you are currently a university student on a campus in Botswana, we want to extend an invitation to you to get plugged into a discipleship group. So if you're interested, if that's something you want to do, if you want to begin to be a part of this family we call Kingdom Movement, we would encourage you to go into this episode's bio. There should be a link to our Instagram page. You can send us a message, and we will make sure to connect you at a time and a place that works best for you and your schedule for school. But we don't want you to miss this opportunity to get plugged in and a part of what God is doing on the university campuses here because we believe that you're a vital piece to what God wants to do to bring his kingdom, his wholeness, and his healing to the nation of Botswana and to the university specifically. So reach out to us today, guys, if that's something you're interested in. All right, thanks.